<clears throat> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have another person by the name of Professor Sean McMeekin, uh, Francis Florney Professor of European History at Bard College in Annandale on the Hudson in New York, and he's going to be talking about making Stalin happy, how the Allies betrayed Poland. Mm -hmm. Professor McMeekin. Good nice morning. You got 20 minutes. Yes. I do feel a, a little bit like an, an interloper here, being neither Jewish nor Polish. Um, but I suppose as, as a Scots-Irish American, when I was reading the, uh, the stereotypes of Bieganski, uh, I could perhaps obliquely relate. Um, what it really uh, reminded me of, however, reading through that astonishing list of stereotypes of the dumb peasant was the view of most of official Washington and pretty much all of American academia of Trump voters. Um, quite eerie, in fact. Um, so I want to talk about the Allies' betrayal of Poland. Um, some of you may or may not have seen the piece I wrote in the Wall Street Journal in August. I hope I didn't create any negative memes in that piece um, about the Warsaw Uprising. I don't really want to talk about the Warsaw Uprising, though, and I don't think, in a view of time constraints, I'm quite going to get all the way to Tehran and Yalta. Um, so I may not get all the way to this theme about trying to keep Stalin happy. I thought it might actually be more useful to talk about material which is much less familiar, uh, material earlier on in the war. Um, by way of background, I'm writing a book tentatively called Stalin's War. I don't have my graphic up yet because it's not done yet, nor unfortunately do I have my maps yet. This was just culled from online. Uh, my maps are sort of in the process of being made, so my apologies, I don't have really good maps yet. Um, so Poland features prominently in the story um, but it really is a broader story about war aims, about geopolitics, about diplomacy. And what I actually do want to talk about today are, I think, some of the lesser known aspects of, of what we might call the Allied betrayal of Poland, which actually date to the earliest moments of the war and, in fact, even before the war. But it's not an entirely one-sided story. I don't want this all to be about Chamberlain, Roosevelt, Churchill, and others betraying promises, but rather about the, the two-sided nature of, of the relationship. And frankly, I think there was a lot of naivete, wishful thinking, um, and perhaps even unrealistic appraisals on the Polish side. To begin with, if we go back to the notorious guarantee of March 31st, 1939, the guarantee by Neville Chamberlain, which has been pilloried ever since, uh, both because on the one hand, a little bit like a, a reverse Goldilocks, and the one there, on the one hand, it was not strong enough, because of course he did not guarantee Poland's territorial integrity, rather simply her independence. Um, on the other hand, it was perhaps too strong. I mean, there's actually a school of thought, believe it or not, in British historiography that this was a very reckless act, which was wholly out of character with traditionally aloof British diplomacy, essentially putting Britain on the line for a country that, frankly, Britain had not really been all that close to. That in and of itself is, of course, quite interesting. Part of the reason Chamberlain was equivocal in this declaration, there are a number of reasons, um, some of them political relating to cabinet politics, the fact that he didn't really have support for a broader and more sweeping declaration. Some of it related, frankly, to Chamberlain's own uncomfortable relationship with recent Polish history. Uh, this isn't perhaps the best form to mention this, but I'm sure you're all familiar with Poland's role at Munich uh, in helping to some extent uh, even though in a very small sense, a subsidiary sense to the Germans uh, uh, take territory from Czechoslovakia. So Poland was already in, in something of, not a foul state exactly, but was not a, a really big cause in England at the time. It was almost an accident that Poland happened to be the country that Britain ended up deciding to take her stand on. It was not really out of any great enthusiasm. Uh, there were great and grave reservations. Those reservations, in fact, went much deeper than just the story of Munich and recent Polish dealings, of course, with Germany going back to 1934, where relations had been reasonably friendly between Warsaw and Berlin. They went back to the First World War. It's curious that, I'll get to Churchill in a moment, but I mean Churchill because he's such an important figure. It's important to remember that Churchill was both a statesman and, of course, a writer, something of a historian. He fancied himself. He wrote with great bias. But he was obsessed with history. He was obsessed 
blessed with honor, and he remembered that as he would frequently remind Polish interlocutors of the Second World War, more Poles had fought on the side of the Central Powers in the First World War than on the side of Russia. Um, now, Churchill often would kind of switch sides. He wasn't always consistent, but this was, in fact, a common view in the British establishment. That is to say, a little bit of holding the nose in the air. Poland was not really wholly trustworthy. Oddly enough, the British were fonder of the Russian cause, even though, of course, the Bolsheviks had toppled the government that had been allied to the other countries of the Entente powers. So the, the relationship was a slightly fraught one, but it was highly ambiguous. So Chamberlain's guarantee was equivocal. Was it sincerely meant? That's another interesting question. When, of course, the Poles tried to probe, there's a famous meeting with uh, General Edmund Ironside, chief of the British Imperial General Staff, who goes to Warsaw in June 1939. Josef Beck and various others try to get Britain to kind of put some meat behind the bones. Will you send us weapons? Will you send us RAF squadrons? What will you do for us? And it was basically given the runaround. Britain really made no commitment, certainly no commitment to send actual squadrons. Even the dispatch of hurricane fighters was made essentially conditional on a loan being floated. And it wasn't a guarantee that that loan would actually pass. And in fact, it didn't. Basically, these negotiations bogged down. Now, it's true that Maurice Gamelin, speaking ostensibly on behalf of the French general staff, made this famous promise about hurling the bulk of the French armies across the Rhine as soon as Hitler moved against Poland, supposedly within 15 days. But here again, we have an element of, I think, naivete. Good faith on the Polish side, but perhaps naivete. It's not just that morale in the French high command, morale in the French government, and in Paris more particularly. Um, there's a famous headline, Maurice Deat, uh, if the French were really ready to mourir pour Danzig, will they really die for Danzig? Even beyond that, the fact is by 1939, the French could barely tie their shoes without British permission. Uh, there were a number of reasons for that, but one of the biggest of which is that France had signed a mutual assistance pact of the same kind that Britain and France were about to have with Poland with the Soviet Union. First negotiated in 1935 and then inked formally, finally ratified after months of delay in February 1936. Uh, only days later, of course, Hitler militarized or invaded the Rhineland, thus essentially humiliating the French and leaving them prostrate and essentially almost begging for the British to bail them out of their own humiliation and stupidity. Um, if you actually look at Franco-British uh, or Anglo-French diplomacy in the months before the Second World War, a couple of things are quite famous. There was the, the mission they sent to the Soviet Union in August, quite famously low level in the British case. Um, Reginald Drax, Admiral Drax, did not even have credentials sufficient to negotiate with Stalin, as many have noticed. Uh, the French representative, Dumont, he did. Um, and so the French were a little more serious about it than the British were. But here's a question I want to pose to you. Why were the British and French trying to get Stalin to sign on to some sort of mutual assistance pact in 1939 if they supposedly had a security arrangement with Poland? Have you ever actually thought about this? Well, I don't think they actually expected that Poland would be able to withstand the German onslaught. Otherwise, why would they actually have wanted to prostrate themselves before the mass murdering dictator of the Kremlin? In the end, of course, it came to nothing. And as we all know, the molotov ribbentrop Pact happened and everything went in the other direction. Hitler and Stalin planned the fourth partition of Poland. All this is very familiar to you. Uh, if you actually look even more closely at Chamberlain, I've already given him a bit of grief about this ambivalent, half-hearted security guarantee. If you actually read the Mutual Assistance Pact updated after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact signed on the 25th of August 1939, what's quite interesting about that pact, you have to actually read these things closely, and I'm not sure everyone in Warsaw did. What that pact actually said was that Britain would promise at once to give the contracting party all the support and assistance in her power if that country were invaded. It did not actually men mention Germany. It didn't mention the Soviet Union either. And there was nothing binding. There were no promises about the imminent dispatch of military force, about the bombing of German cities or air bases. Nothing was actually promised to Poland. It's really strange if you look at the cabinet minutes of the last days of August 1939. Chamberlain, on the one hand, he's usually pilloried for being appeasement-minded and soft and all that. But no, in fact, it's quite the opposite. He expresses, and he actually used the word distasteful 
It was distasteful to him that he had heard from Warsaw that negotiations were underway and the Poles might actually reach a deal with the Germans. That he found distasteful. On the other hand, and this is even more interesting, when other members of the cabinet mooted the possibility, the French were already talking about this, should we evacuate the children from London if, if there's a real war danger? He said, no, 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 no need. So far as I understand, Herr Hitler has no plans to undertake anything against us, but rather will wait for us to attack him. So on the one hand, Chamberlain wants Poland to go to war with Germany. He has no plans to help of an operational nature. He's a little bit, shall we say, distressed that Poland is rumored to be maybe actually even negotiating with the Germans. On the other hand, he also does not expect Hitler to attack Britain. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense until we understand the ambiguity and the ambivalence with which the British regarded Poland. Now, I've just given Chamberlain a lot of grief, and now I'm going to light into Churchill, uh, who's something of a sacred cow here in the United States, at least among, you know, shall we say, uh, not all political persuasions. These days he gets grief for other reasons, but I'm saying, like, more traditionally, Americans have, have worshipped the altar, altar of Churchill. Of course, Barack Obama famously didn't, and there's a whole scandal about sending the bust of Churchill back to the British, which is slightly overdone. Um, but anyway, if we get to Churchill, here's the thing. Yes, he's supposedly the, the tough guy who's standing up to Nazi German aggression, the man who supposedly has the best interests of the smaller countries. He always talked about the, the heroic small fighting nations, you know, in the First World War, Belgium, Serbia, the, the heroic nations. So he's supposedly a great partisan of the Polish cause. Interestingly, the first interview he gave with the BBC after the Soviet Union invaded Poland on the 17th of September 1939, most of you know this, most Americans, of course, do not, thus forcing the Polish government quite famously to give up the ghost. They had fled to the eastern extremity of Poland to escape the Germans, and the Soviets invaded, so of course they fled into Romania and were forced by the Romanian government to actually forfeit their credentials, so they were no longer a government. After this happened, Churchill gave an interview with the BBC. What did he say? Well, let's see. He said that... Um, Stalin's invasion of Eastern Poland in the interests of her own safety, that is to say the Soviet Union's own safety, um, was, was quite reasonable. Now, so pleased with this was the Soviet ambassador in Britain, Maisky, that he actually called in Churchill to thank him. Now, far from just a one-off with the media, in fact, in the minutes of the War Cabinet from October and November 1939, Churchill consistently takes a position in favor of the Soviet carving out of eastern Poland. Because, as he said, no doubt it appeared reasonable for the Russians, as an ally of France and Britain in the previous war, to recover her borders which were once acceptable to us. Now, this is the, um, I don't think this is the cursor. Could we maybe just go briefly to the next, uh, the previous map? There should be two maps, I think. Do I do this with the clicker? Oh, no, that, that's just the same map, but bigger. Do we have another map? We just have one map there. Uh, oh, Kurzon line, there it is, it's right below, right below. There we go, yes. Okay, so the famous Kurzon line. Now, a couple of things to say about this. You'll see it in a moment, I hope anyway, if it comes up here on the screen. The, the thing about the Kurzon line, uh, which the British became quite obsessed with in the course of uh, diplomacy in the Second World War. A couple of really interesting things about the Curzon Line. The first, of course, is all, most of you here know, because you know Poland's history. The Curzon Line, of course, was not the interwar boundary of Poland, as we quite famously know, because, in fact, in the Polish-Soviet War of 1920, the Poles actually went beyond it. It's important to remember about that war, incidentally, that Lloyd George, at the time Prime Minister of the British government, had actually cut off Poland from receiving arms shipments shortly before before the war happened. So Britain saw that war as essentially kind of almost illegal and unjust. Um, some of this because, again, Pilsudski, I talked about Britain's ambivalence towards, towards Poland. He had, of course, famously supported Austria-Hungary, probably for his own reasons in the First World War. Um, he had also not really supported the whites in the Russian Civil War. So there are various reasons for the ambivalence, but the point being that the British thought the Curzon Line was essentially right and just. Poland's interwar borders were not. So it wasn't just what happened to Czechoslovakia in 1939. The British were never committed to the integrity of Poland's borders prior to the Second World War. They never were. They didn't really see them as legitimate. In fact, it's quite interesting, Lloyd George himself actually comes out of retirement, and he gives an interview with the Sunday Express on September 24, 1939, 
in which he actually quite explicitly almost endorses the Soviet invasion of Eastern Poland as somehow kind of rectifying um, the unjustness of Polish aggression in the War of 1920. Um, so um, Lloyd George essentially then was taking the position that the Russian invasion, the carving out, I guess we've lost the maps here, haven't we? Uh, we've lost the maps. Well, you know what the Curzon line is. You know that in the course of the war, Churchill becomes increasingly obsessed with the Curzon line. There's actually a, a time at Tehran um, where they, they briefly try to, um, to try to correct the Russians about this, this business, about how they, what the Russians want, of course, is the Molotov-Rippentrop line, which is in fact not quite the Curzon line. The Molotov-Rippentrop line, of course, had also these bulges basically heading out, including some of the oil fields of East Galicia uh, near Lvov. And then, of course, if you look a little bit further north, there was also the, the so-called Bialystok bulge. Uh, but the point being, the British were not really committed. Uh, they were not committed to restoring Poland's interwar borders. If they were committed to anything, maybe this idea about the Curzon line borders, but they were not really fully on board with the Polish project. Churchill, in fact, was so pro-Soviet in 1939 that he also essentially endorsed Soviet aggression against the Baltic neighbors as well. Again, on this principle, which is quite interesting when you think about it, that Russia was just restoring her old borders. Because, of course, you could make the same argument about Germany in 1939. Frankly, you could make the same argument about Poland at any time after 1939. It was a selective thinking based in large part upon Churchill's memory of this brotherhood in arms in the First World War with Russia. Of course, strangely, the Bolsheviks had overthrown the government that had been part of that brotherhood of arms. So Churchill had a kind of selective memory. You know, he was very intense about certain things he remembered, not necessarily about others. Now, because I don't have time to get all the way to Yalta, in the few minutes that I have left, because I think we've been pinched in slightly, shall we say, by all the speakers of this morning, I want to briefly tell you about um, a little-known aspect of the story of Katyn. Because to me, the real Allied betrayal, important as it is that Churchill and Roosevelt essentially agreed to suppress the story in 1943, we all know about that, maybe not the full extent of it, but we know that they essentially agreed to hush up the story uh, to keep Stalin happy. Back in 1940, however, the one thing one almost never hears, including even in the very interesting lecture yesterday about Katyn, was why it happened when it did. That is, what was Stalin actually up to? Well, dilatory, half-hearted, and uh, shall we say uh, hypocritical as the Allies had been about the German and Soviet invasion of Poland, of course declaring war only on only one of the countries invading Poland, quite famously not on the other. They actually had this sort of uh, dancing on a pin debate about this, and they decided that in fact what they had agreed with the French was it was only if a European country invaded Poland they would declare war. Uh, thus taking the position of Russian Slavophiles, that Russia was actually an Asiatic country. But after Stalin invaded Finland, there was a little bit of a change of heart in the Allied camp. For a while, in fact, it didn't seem like the Germans were up to much of anything, and the Soviets were now the bold aggressors. They were expelled from the League of Nations. People are gathering funds and arms and aid money and sending, sending food packets to Finland, and it looked like the Allies were getting serious. In fact, they were getting quite serious in February 1940. And Stalin knew this. He knew not only that the British were training legions of expeditionary forces of Poles and French and British troops who were actually expected to land in Finland in early March 1940. He also knew the Allies had planned to bomb the Soviet oil facilities in the Transcaucasus. We know this not just from Russian sources but from American sources because the Russians actually asked the Americans what would happen if the Allies bombed Baku and they said yeah there would be a great big conflagration and you won't get any oil from there from months, if not years, to come. Stalin received that report on the 2nd of March, 1940. On the 3rd of March, he actually told the American ambassador that he was basically frightened of the bogeyman of Allied intervention, with the Poles going to Finland, the Poles also possibly landing in the Caucasus, the Allies finally giving some moral point to this hypocritical war by declaring war on Hitler's ally, who was just as bold an aggressor as, of course, Hitler was. Stalin responded to this, as we now know, by issuing the notorious order of the 5th of March, 1940, leading to what we now refer to as the Katyn Massacre. One small point uh, for the record, uh, the numbers that they were actually supposed to execute was actually 25,700. Believe it or not, Beria's men underperformed. They missed their target by several thousand. Um, but we know how the story ends, of course. The Allies 
dilatory, half-hearted, perhaps their heart's not really in it, did not intervene against Stalin. Now, Stalin, because he had such great intelligence, not only took his preemptive vengeance against the Polish officers, the Polish elites, the Polish officials, etc., but he also ended the war in Finland sh long before anyone expected him to. He agreed to very, shall we say, modest, moderate armistice terms on the 12th of March, though maintaining and reserve the threat of invading Finland at, at any time he, he chose necessary afterwards. The Allies missed their chance. The final coda, you might say, to what I see as the Allied betrayal, not just of Poland, really, but of what might have been a far juster, a far more consistent, and a far more effective resistance. Because, of course, it was not just Stalin who was dependent on the oil reserves of the Transcaucasus, which furnished three quarters orders of Soviet reserves, they also furnished about a third of the German oil supply, particularly in 1940 as the Germans famously invaded countries like Normandy, the Low Countries, France, etc. They missed their chance. Final code here because I know that I'm essentially out of time. Um, there's a British diplomat come spy. Uh, interestingly, he's also involved in the Allied betrayal of Yugoslavia, which is an entirely different story. Oddly enough, like Churchill, he was supposedly a conservative, but he took the communist side on everything. Fitzroy McLean. Now, McLean had contacts with an organization called Prometheus, which was actually funded by the Polish government, which also had elements in Ukraine and in Georgia and even in the Transcaucasus, involving, among others, Said Shamil, grandson of the great Imam warrior of the jihad against Russia in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Long story. The point being that Fitzroy McLean had these contacts. He was the point man who was negotiating with the Turks and with the French for what was to be become the Allied intervention against Soviet Russia. The British actually sent him to Paris in early May 1940, en route for Damascus, to lead what would have been this great new Allied war against the Soviet Union. He never made it to Ankara, nor did he make it to Damascus, because of course, as we knew, the Germans invaded France. <laughs> and so Fitz, Fitzroy McLean, he, he, he filed one last report on the 15th of May, um, and then he fled back to London. So the Allies, I think, missed their chance. Long before the betrayal of Poland at Tehran, I haven't even lit into Roosevelt. There's no time for Roosevelt. But can I do one point about Roosevelt? Sorry, because I've given Churchill and the British so much grief. I don't want you to think I'm, I'm blind because I'm American to the faults of my own country. So in addition to his famous promise to Stalin that he would be more agreeable after the 1944 elections, this was at Tehran. You know, he basically, it's fine if you want to carve out eastern Poland. It's fine if you want to have sham elections. That's all fine. Just understand there are six million Americans of Polish extraction, and as a practical man, I would not like to lose their votes. So please keep this quiet until after the 1944 elections. He said that at Tehran, incidentally, before his own advisors even knew he was going to run for re-election a fourth time in 1944. He told Stalin that before his own advisors. Um, the last point about Roosevelt, this is just by way of an aside, you might say, a coda or a tidbit, but I find it quite interesting. While it's true that, that Churchill agreed to essentially lean on the press and lean on the polls to stop complaining about Katyn, this is in April and May of 1943, Roosevelt went further. He didn't just officially endorse the lie about Katyn. He actually said to Comrade Stalin in a private letter that if uh, he needed any help in solving his Polish problem, that was the phrase he used, he would be happy to take any polls off of Stalin's hands. That is, he encouraged Stalin essentially to send polls to the United States, which I suppose was a generous offer of sorts. Um, Stalin, of course, pretended to be deeply offended. He said, you know, all polls are my friends and comrades, and I would never dream of such a thing. At a time, of course, when Roosevelt um, uh, uh, apparently did not know about the Katyn massacre. Churchill did, incidentally. Churchill had more or less figured out the truth by about mid to late May 1943, but agreed, I think, in, again, to keep Stalin happy that he would keep that quiet. It was just making things too complicated for the Allies. I also think that all that was misguided. There was an argument, we heard elements of this yesterday, that the Allies did this, if it was for any reason, it was because, oh, everyone needed the great all-conquering Red Army. Well, at the time this was done, from May 1943 right on to Tehran, the Soviets, of course, were still in eastern Ukraine in April and May 1943. They hadn't even really taken Kharkov yet. And meanwhile, their armies were entirely dependent on American Lend-Lease aid in the form of tens of thousands of tanks, hundreds of thousands of trucks, jeeps, and lorries, 
more than 15,000 warplanes, along with all of the steel armor plate, all of the aluminum, all of the other non-ferrous metals required in Soviet war industry, along with, of course, all of the foodstuffs, such as the ubiquitous spam, to Sonka pork, and even borscht. Did you know that the Americans actually sent the Russians borscht in these tiny little packets the size of matchboxes? Dehydrated borscht with an interesting recipe that actually included, if you can believe this, bay leaves. They actually fed the Red Army not just pork products, including 17 different kinds of canned sausage. They also fed them borscht. The Russians could not have done a thing without American Lend-Lease Aid in the Second World War. That was immense leverage, immense leverage forfeited to no purpose by the Roosevelt administration, honeycombed as it was by Soviet agents of influence. And I'm going to leave things right there.